I don't know about you, but when I think about nature, I often picture the countryside. I think about vast meadows full of wildflowers or dense woodlands thick with trees that harbour a multitude of different species. For me, nature can often feel like something that's far away, that I have to travel to experience. It can be hard to imagine it as being something that's here, where I am right now. But as you can see, we are surrounded by trees and there's all kinds of different wildlife here, even though we are right in the heart of London in our very own museum gardens. Now, this area is obviously very urban. There's lots of buildings and houses all around us. We're right next to a busy road. You can probably hear the traffic and also construction work going on. But little pockets of green space like this can be a surprising haven for wildlife in our urban jungle. In this series, we aim to show and tell you about the nature that could be flourishing right on your doorstep. And maybe we can even inspire you to get outside and discover what's in your local area. We will take you on a journey through the seasons and give you tips on the natural wonders that you can look out for. In the last episode, we were taking a look at spring and you can find links to that video at the end of this one. In this episode, we are discovering what happens in the summer and I'll be joined by a museum scientist who will reveal places that are surprisingly resplendent with nature. Nature that is sometimes hidden or taken for granted among the hustle and bustle of everyday life in a town or city. We will discover amazing stories of survival and growth and take a closer look at the surprising biodiversity that exists in the tiniest areas that we walk past every day but often ignore. Join us as we take you on a journey through the seasonal changes. We're now in summer and it's certainly been a very hot one so far. What kind of things can we see this time of year? So this time of year everything is just in full flow. We've got as much biodiversity as we're really likely to see happening in the garden. The most obvious change is how much all of the trees and bushes and shrubs and everything are in full leaf and also in a lot of cases in full bloom as well. So there's an awful lot going on. That means we've got lots and lots of shelter and cover but we've also got lots of food too. So there's so much wildlife out here right now. Oh, fantastic. And last time in the spring episode, we did go and look at a tree just down here. Should we see what's going on with that now? Absolutely, let's go. Let's do it. So when we were here in spring, this tree was just coming into bud. We were getting the leaves coming out and now it's looking, well, a lot greener than it did last time. <laughs> So what kind of things have changed other than the obvious like leaf difference? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, obviously we have a lot of leaves. Everything has really come through, but that gives so much opportunity for wildlife. This tree is now providing shade. It's providing cover and shelter, but it's also providing a lot more food opportunities as well. So there's loads and loads of wildlife that we can see just on a single tree, which is really fascinating. Individual trees can provide hosts to so many different species, particularly invertebrates, whether it's on the leaves, in amongst all the little twigs and branches, or of course, right in amongst the bark as well. This tree in particular, this is the hazel that was looked at in the spring. So if we look up at this tree really, really closely, we're gonna see evidence of an awful lot of wildlife in here, even if it doesn't necessarily look immediately like there's a lot going on. If we look just at this one leaf here, you see these white patches, this little bit of brown damage oh, yeah. here as well. We can see a little bit about what's going on. This is all some of the leaf miner, beetles and moths and lots of other, other species which need these leaves to survive. Over here, can you see really carefully here, we see we've even got a couple of little caterpillars. Oh yeah, just tucked oh, in there. Spotted those. Yeah, so small. They're so well camouflaged, yeah. aren't they? So you really need to look quite carefully sometimes but it's amazing when you start to watch and see what's going on, actually what's happening. Yeah, and speaking about tiny organisms as well, we've got to talk about the soil. Yes. Last time we mentioned about how much biodiversity there really is in the soil. So um, what can you tell me about it this time of year? Well, the soil, of course, is the absolute starting point of so much biodiversity. It's an absolute powerhouse of biodiversity. It really drives everything that's going on up above it. So the type and nature of soil that that everything is growing from is entirely down to the soil that it grows out of. And the soil is so full of life when you start to get down into it. This time of year though, things are getting quite dry. We've had a lot of hot weather recently. 
we've got to dig down a little bit deeper to find really what's going on. Everything has sort of gone down a little bit further. That's not to say though that there isn't interesting things going on. If we were to take some of the leaf litter that's accumulating underneath the trees and the hedges around here, we'd find all sorts of things in there. Things that actually you can find all year, but it's just so wonderful to look at them in the summer. We might even, if we were really lucky, find some terrestrially hunting newts and other amphibians as well. People always forget about these sorts of leaf litter areas as being really important in the summer um, as terrestrial habitats for, mm. for amphibians as well. And speaking of newts, we are very lucky at the museum that we do have a pond here, yes. aren't we? So um, yeah. should we go have a look at that and see if maybe we might get lucky and find a newt? Let's go and have a look. So when we're here in the last episode, this ponds are looking, well, they're looking a lot more greener now than they were previously. So Steph, if we have got water near us, what are the kind of things we can look out for? So the most obvious thing, of course, is the plants and the marginal vegetation around the banks, but also the vegetation in the pond has completely changed and that's supporting a whole host of different wildlife. One of the first things you can look for, and obviously being careful around water while you're doing so, is look at some of the reeds and grasses and rushes that are around the banks of the pond and see if you can see some exuviae. Now they are the cases from dragonflies and damselflies where the larva has emerged out of the water, gripped onto the plant stem and then the adult has hatched out of the back of the larva. Now that leaves this case of the larva still gripping tightly onto the, onto the plant stem and they're really, really easy to spot. So they can be a really good place to start. But of course, across the whole of the pond, you can see here, we've got lots and lots of frog bit. That's these tiny little miniature water lilies that we can see here. They provide a great surface, a great foraging habitat. And we've actually got some insects hopping around on the top right now. But also underneath, they provide shade, shelter, and habitat for foraging as well for a whole host of different species. We've got pond skaters on the top and water boatmen skimming around on the surface. And then further down, we've got so many snails in this pond, mm. you wouldn't believe. But then there's water beetles and, and all sorts of things happening in there, even down to tiny little ostracods. We've also got lots and lots of amphibians. Great time to spot juvenile newts. So the adults only have to be in ponds to breed. They're now spread around the whole of the garden, both in the pond and beyond. But the juveniles, what we call efts, um, are tiny little uh, miniature newts right now with little gills sticking out of the sides of their necks. And they, they're fantastic, but they have to stay in the water for right now. Similarly, we're into froglet and toadlet season here as well. So the tadpoles that we had in spring are now out and about and wandering across the whole garden. We've got hundreds of those scattered about the place at the moment. It's a wonderful time of year. Yeah, oh, frogs and toads are always my favourites to look out for. And I was going to say, we did have a handy duck here in the last episode that led me perfectly on to birds. So we might have to go elsewhere to go and look for some. So should we go and find some birds somewhere? Yeah, absolutely. It's also a great place to look for birds around your pond too, because we're going to get them foraging on some of the invertebrates. And let's go and see what we can find elsewhere in the garden. So in the spring episode we mentioned this huge influx of birds that come into the British Isles um, at that time of year. What kind of behaviours are going on at this time of year and what kind of species can we expect to see? So we haven't got migrations happening in the same way that we do in spring and in autumn. What's going on now is uh, we've, got a, we've still got egg laying going on, so we have got some breeding still happening, but mostly a lot of the birds that we've got in the garden are busy raising young. So they've perhaps got chicks still in the nest, or we might have chicks fledging even. There's molting happening. What it does mean is that the bird song is quite a bit quieter than it was early on in the year. Birds are no longer trying to attract mates in the same way. They're not quite as territorial, perhaps, so they're not claiming territories with loud songs like we, like we enjoy hearing. So this time of year, everything's a little bit more settled down. What we do see, which is absolutely wonderful to see, of course, is lots and lots of fledglings hopping about the place, looking a little bit confused about life <laughs> and also looking a little bit messy still while their feathers are still coming through. They are potentially quite at risk as well at this time of year because we do also have foxes in the garden. But it's a great time, of course, for so much bird foraging going on. 
We're seeing birds racing around, trying to get the most feed they possibly can into their chicks right now. Uh, so we've got birds all over the ponds, picking up insects from the surface of the ponds and even attacking some of our dragonflies and damselflies. We've got birds starting to look for seeds as some of the flowers are going over and into seed and also starting to look for berries. We've got a fantastic few rowan trees with these beautiful bright red and orange berries like the one just behind us and they are fantastic food source for birds. Anything which provides wonderful early fruit like that is a real resource and we're just as well starting to get things like uh, blackberries starting to come uh, through and ripening as well. So it's a really uh, successful time to be a bird right now, out and foraging and busy feeding up your young. So the other thing we've got to talk about, of course, is the insects, which are hugely important. Shall we go and see some of the habitats that we might find insects in? Yeah, let's go. Great. Let's do it. So one of my favourite things to look out for at this time of year is obviously butterflies and moths. So what kind of species can we look out for and what other insects are going to be around as well? Great time of year to be looking for butterflies, of course. There's the vibrant orange of gatekeepers um, all over the place. We've got all the whites out as well. Um, we've, we've lost some of the early spring species, so the orange tips and things aren't so prevalent anymore. Um, but you might find uh, some of the peacocks, some of the red admirals as well. If you were to go a little bit further into some parts of the countryside, it's also a great time of year to find things like purple emperors as well, which is my favourite butterfly. So there's lots and lots out there. And also as well, it's a great time of year to be looking out for some of the little blue butterflies. I saw common blues in my garden just yesterday, which is lovely to see that. It's really good. But moths as well, great time of year for moths. We're right into hawk moth season in the summer. So there's some amazing moths. Uh, if you happen to be lucky to be out in the evening or have a bright light or even get to go and see a moth trap. As for other insects, there's so much happening right now. There's so many things in flower and also lots and lots of things in seed as well. Like you can see uh, in the meadow behind us, we've got lots of yarrow and wild carrots and things like that in flower. Those big white flowering heads, those big umbellifers, they're actually really great dancing stages and landing stages for lots and lots of invertebrates. Some flies will use them as literally as dance stages to display to each other for mating. You will also get lots of beetles uh, using them uh, to display and to, to find uh, other beetles um, as well. But also it's a great time of year for hoverflies. There's lots and lots of hoverflies, some of which are excellent uh, mimics of things like wasps and bees as well. So it's some wonderful things if you go out and start looking. Now insects, of course, are a really important food source for a lot of animals and that leads us perfectly into mammals. Mm -hmm. So they're a bit more elusive, but what kind of things can we see this time of year? So again, it's always a great time of year to see uh, mammals um, across so many different parts of the country. Uh, in the wildlife garden here, we've got foxes. Elsewhere, you might find, if you're really lucky, you might find uh, weasels or stoats or even badgers, all of which will happily predate on insects. But my favourite mammals are our bats. Um, I've been working with them for years. They're fantastic, um, but absolutely vociferous insect eaters. So all of our bats in the UK are all insectivorous, so they feed on, on insects. And they spend their evenings and the night time hoovering up all of the incredible diversity of night flying insects, which we quite often forget about quite so much. But it's wonderful to get to watch them at night, sitting in the garden or your local green space, uh, just relaxing, but also getting to see these incredible aerial displays as bats are busy foraging around. And at the moment, they're having their pups as well. So they've got their young, so they're really busy uh, feeding themselves up uh, so that they can provide milk for their young. Oh, lovely. And I guess that's the perfect time for people at home. If you want to try and look out for bats, they can just, I guess, sit outside and they're gone dusk. Sit there, relax, outside watch, dusk. and look up towards the sky and like the edges of tree canopies and things. Yeah, and hopefully catch some fire around. Oh, lovely. And yeah, I think, um, should we go and see my favourite part of the garden now, which is over by the pond again? Okay, lovely. <laughs> So the jetty here is one of my favourite places to be in the garden because you can really appreciate this wonderful green space we have here. 
why are green spaces just so important and what are some things people can do to help attract wildlife to them? Green spaces, particularly in urban areas, are absolutely vital for biodiversity. They provide such an interconnected network of different stepping stones and different opportunities for wildlife, which means that wildlife can permeate right into our, even the most ultra uh, urban area. In London this becomes particularly important and it's why our wildlife garden here has become such a hotspot for biodiversity. But what this means is that wildlife can spread out to all the other gardens and green spaces and parks safely without having to travel too far, which means that we get this whole network of biodiversity in and amongst all of our man-made landscapes. Incredibly important. With this one here, we have so much going on, so many different types of habitats all crammed into a very small space. We've got trees, we've got shrubs, we've got hedges, we've got more open grasslands as well. And then of course we have our fantastic ponds here. All of that means that in a really small area, we've got so many opportunities for wildlife, whether they need shelter or food or um, just a space to be and to breed as well. It's incredibly important for wildlife that we not only have but preserve and support and encourage all of these little green hotspots throughout our cities and towns. Well thank you very much Steph for talking about all the wonderful things we can find in our green spaces in summer um, but don't forget that you can find stuff in your areas as well. We're very lucky that we do have the museum gardens here but there's plenty of green spaces out there for you to go and explore and it could be a local park, it could be a hedgerow, it could be a tree outside your house. It could even be something as small as a window box can really make a difference. So it's a perfect time of year to get out and go and explore the wildlife in your local area because you never know what you might find. Be sure to join us in the next episode of Seasonal Changes. But in the meantime, you can record nature in your local area and then come back next season to see how things have changed. Let us know in the comments below what's happening in your neighbourhoods. And if you enjoyed this video, you can also like and subscribe to this channel for more natural history content.